it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Christy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 117 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Guatemalan coffee. It's good. And it's strong because we need it. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the Healthy Nutritious Treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. So how are you doing on this early Friday morning? We're recording early. I'm great. It's beautiful outside. A little bit of a breeze, but the sun is shining. The snowdrops are open. How are things in your place? It's good. It's warmer. And I got some eggs lately. Lots of my pullets, except for the Jubilee Orpingtons, are all laying. And my big girls are starting to lay again. So I'm so happy that day is getting longer and we're getting more eggs. How about you over there? Oh, yeah. We're getting anywhere from three to nine in a day, usually closer to six to nine. So usually about half a dozen a day. We're getting (laughs) from six to 10 a day right now over here. Enough where I'm able to gift our pediatrician a dozen eggs and feel great. She loved them. I love doing that when we get the eggs. It's just so much fun to go out there every day, open up the box and see what's in there. It's like a gift. I'll check the nest boxes three times in a day. I'm never bored. I love it. Every single day, it's great. I'm also checking my run floor because some of the new babies, they don't have the hang of the nest box yet. I'm like, look, there's nest boxes. I do have people in both of my big layer flocks where there's like a coop guard. And the other day, you and I were on the phone, and I think Praline just stopped and squatted in front of me. Oh, yeah. You were like, who laid this egg? Who laid an egg egg? right in front of me. I'm pretty sure it was Praline the Brahma, which tells me that she lays like a medium brown egg with some pretty speckles. So that's nice. When you first get chickens, it's always fun to say, okay, this one's now laying this one. But when you're in the 20s and the 30s, and then you have babies laying, majority of heritage breeds are going to lay different shades of a brown egg. It's hard to know who laid that egg. Well, even with my white egg layers, because I have the Andalusians and with the Faomis, and all four of them lay white eggs. So I know for sure that Catalina, my Andalusian, is laying because twice I've seen her coming out of the box and leaving me a a nice white present. But yesterday, there was no white egg in the box, but there were remnants of white egg shell in a corner of the coop. Oh, God, you got an egg eater. Apparently, and I think it's a Faomi. (laughs) They're like, yummy. We like to cause trouble. This is great. Fresh and delicious. Thank you. With all these eggs, we're able to make some recipes, give some eggs away. This is great. So if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It's another really great way to help us grow and you never miss an episode. You can tell a chicken-loving friend or two about the podcast. Oh, and I wanted to thank our most recent reviewers. We have some great reviews up right now. Thank you. We're loving them. You can tell a chicken-loving friend or two about the podcast. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the mugs and t-shirts that we have there. Thank you to our most recent purchaser, too. Our most popular mug right now is the watercolor with our new logo. That's our new logo. Everyone's loving it. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our three levels of membership there. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. 
In the November box, I absolutely love that glass rooster cutting board and the woven chicken tea towel. I adore those Santa chicken hats and scarves, and I cannot wait to hang those chicken ornaments up on my chicken tree. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. It's a breed spotlight. Is it anytime we're anywhere near Italy, we get that? It's the only Italy one I know. And when and you first started, I was like, wait, is this a Disney theme? What's happening? But, it, <laughs> but yes. Okay, so this week's breed spotlight is... The Sicilian Buttercup. We all know I love those Italian Sicilian Mediterranean breeds. I love them. Me too. The Buttercup has been on my list for quite a while. Now, this is a revisit to the Buttercup. We did it like episode 38, the first year of the podcast, something way back when. The beautiful Sicilian Buttercup is a light-bodied chicken with a crown-shaped cone. The cone is literally connected and forms what looks like a big crown. Who would not want a chicken that has a crown? The Buttercup has been raised on the island of Sicily for hundreds of years, but their origin is unclear. There were other chickens on the island of Sicily that had crown-shaped combs, so most likely the buttercup were some sort of a land race, but farmers did have some breeding input. They maintained the crown, and apparently they maintained the green legs. So we'll talk about the green legs a few times. There was no breed standard for the buttercup for a long time, either in their native country or the U.S. or the U.K., until about a little over 100 years ago. The buttercup is a member of the Mediterranean class. Yes, it is. And we're proud of it. And get this. They are currently considered critically endangered by the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. Now, when we were talking to Jeanette Berenger of the Livestock Conservancy a while ago, and this one came up, I was kind of surprised, but not. I kind of put this chicken in lines with the Silky. There's not another chicken like it out there. It has a very unique look. It's very different. It might be the only one that I know of with the crown comb. You would think a a chicken like this would be more readily available to keep the lines going, but unfortunately, it's the opposite. I mean, buttercups are similar to a couple of the other small breeds, but you're right. They are the only modern breed with a crown-shaped cone. Yeah. Now, they closely resemble the golden pencil Fayumi. Oh, boy. You don't really see the golden Fayumis here, but they very closely resemble. If you look up the two of them, you'll see they have a marked resemblance. They also share some traits with the Golden Campine and the Gold Hamburg. Both beautiful birds. Yeah, they are. Now, the Fayumis and the Buttercups very well may be related. They're both located on the Mediterranean Sea, and they have a similar body shape, similar coloring, and those green legs. The green legs set them apart again. There are just so many different little intricate things that make this chicken so interesting. We have seen several sources that speculate that the buttercups may have originated in North Africa, like the Fayumis, and I can see that. Yeah, me too. And if you look at trade between Sicily and North Africa, I mean, there was very ready trade. There's a lot of architecture and other influence. I don't find it hard to believe that these chickens may have circulated back and forth, and the ones in Sicily developed a little differently. Now, we're not entirely sure where the name comes from, buttercup. The buff coloring? It could be the buff coloring, like they're golden, Mm -hmm. they're golden like a buttercup, or it could be because the cup-shaped comb is kind of like a flower. I I can see either or. 
Yeah, either one. I'm not sure. It's a charming name either way. I love it. I really tend to think it could be the coloring of the chicken. I would lean more towards coloring myself. Yeah. Yeah. So according to the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection, the buttercup was first imported to the U.S. back in 1835. Okay. Now, I couldn't find any information about that. Clearly, they have some because, you know, this is printed in the Standard of Perfection. The Livestock Conservancy notes that there was a second importation in 1860, and that one has more documentation. We know that someone named Mr. Carol Loring of Massachusetts received birds from his neighbor, Captain Dawes, and Dawes likely imported them from Sicily, and he bred them for several decades. Now, Lewis Wright... Of course. Bit, well, I'm telling you, he wrote about almost every bird you can find. He does not let me down. So he shares a bit more of the story in Wright's Book of Poultry. Captain Dawes ran a trading ship between Boston, Massachusetts, and the island of Sicily. My copy of Wright's Book of Poultry, some of the print is very faint, and I was trying to make out the name of this trading ship. You got to be like my mom and put multiple pairs of glasses on. I think it's just too light. It looks like it begins with an F. This cannot be right, but it looks like Froederer. <laughs> I know. I so whatever the name of his ship, I don't know what it was. It begins with an F. He ran this trading ship back and forth between Boston and Sicily. I can imagine he was importing all kinds of cool stuff. So at the end of one voyage to Sicily, apparently he goes out into the market and he buys a crate of chickens with the intent of eating them during the voyage. Oh, boy. Well, he's got to stay alive. It's hard to keep fresh meat on a ship. I mean, it's oh, the 1960s. I just don't like so. to hear it. I just don't like to hear it. Well, it was their lucky day because as the ship got under sail, the hens began to lay. And they're and like, they oh, this will keep yes. us less hungry now. Exactly. We can eat these all the time. The hens were such good layers and the eggs were so delicious that Captain Dawes decided to keep them as laying hens. Essentially, he and the crew just made pets out of these birds because they were very right. sweet and gentle birds. So when the ship docks in Boston, Captain Dawes takes the crate of buttercups and he sends them to his father's farm. And from there, a few notable breeders obtain them. So we have a pretty good idea right there of how the buttercups got to the U.S. The buttercups ended up, much like the leghorn, in the U.K. via the U.S. Oh, so sometimes we get chickens from the U.K. and then some other times they get chickens from us. This is an interesting little twist. Sicily to the U.S., then back to the U.K. Pretty right. cool. The Standard of Perfection also notes that all Sicilian buttercup stock in the U.S. are descended from or related to hatching eggs that were imported to the U.S. in 1892. For whatever reason, the buttercup has never become a super popular breed in the U.S. I don't understand this. It's a cool well, chicken. Here's what I was wondering, and I'm totally just making this up. This is just me guessing. They were in Boston, Massachusetts. The buttercup is not a cold, hardy bird. So I'm wondering if those first two importations eventually failed, and that's why they needed to carry lines on from those hatching eggs that came in the 1890s. Well, you know what? This is a good argument for some people out there that say chickens survived in the cold all this long. They probably didn't. Just because the species of chicken survived does not mean there weren't hundreds of thousands of individual birds dying from the cold. Yeah. Even after that, I'm surprised they didn't pick up in popularity. Me too. I think they're just beautiful birds. They were accepted to the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1918. And we're just guessing the reason behind the APA statement that all buttercups in the U.S. now descended from those eggs in 1892. I mean, it's but, a really good guess. I mean, yeah. honestly, if they were in New England, they had some of the harshest winter ever. And they're a bird from an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It makes sense. Right. It does. I mean, I suppose if there were also too few of them, if there were only, say, two or three breeding flocks, there could have been so few of them that if they were all wiped out by predators, that would have been the end of it. We're speculating at this yeah. point, but it's still sad to me. Oh, I agree. Now, they have beautiful colors and feather patterns. I mean, I think they're just the most beautiful birds. Hens are this beautiful orange buff color, and they have black spangles on the end of each feather. Their heads and necks are a straight buff color. If you have not seen this chicken, look it up now while you're listening and get a look at them. They're beautiful. The roosters are absolutely gorgeous. They're bright copper and russet feathers, and they have the iridescent black and green tail feathers. And of course, when you see the rooster, you know it's a buttercup because he has a giant cup-shaped comb. They have white earlobes, one of our favorite things. We love the white earlobes. Yes. And they have those willow green legs. And like we said before, they have the willow green legs in common with the Fayumis. 
Now, a green leg is one of the more complicated colors to get. That's how we know that the Sicilian farmers did put some work into these birds. Right. And the way you get those green, or sometimes they're called willow colored legs, is you need a blue leg and then you need a bird with yellow skin bred with the blue legged bird. Yellow skin over blue skin makes green, right? Yellow and blue makes green. And that's correct. The easiest way to do this is just breed your buttercup setter to breed standard and you're good. You're good to go. You got green legs. It's funny though, because the Fayumis, one of my Fayumis, Zara, is breed standard and she has willow legs, but Delilah's not. Delilah has blue legs. Yeah. We've known that since they were tiny. Like you were like, oh my God. Yep. Okay, so here's the thing that I find so interesting about this bird. They're on the small side of standard normal, but to me, they're always like a bantam, but they're not. And there's a bantam size to this chicken, which blows my mind. I feel like the weights are bigger than they look when you look at them. Does that make sense? Roosters are about six pounds and hens are about five. They don't look that big to me. They don't to me either. But then again, the Andalusians don't either. Mine look big to me, like, because I'm used to Lucy, so they're kind of the same size. I think they're just very compact. The Bantam is a quarter the size of the standard version, which makes a buttercup Bantam that is less than two pounds. So at that point, you're looking at a bird that's pretty much a true Bantam. It's not because it has a large counterpart, but size-wise, it's tiny. Let's go into the numbers of eggs they lay. Hens are going to lay medium to small white eggs, about 150 to 180 per year, about three to four per week. This is a little less than your usual Mediterranean breed. Usually Mediterranean breeds are big time layers. Well, for all we know, some of the egg laying may have been bred out of them at the expense of other characteristics. It's hard to know. In 1860, was three to four eggs a week fantastic? Right. We've talked about this before. Like, did they want monster egg layers or were they okay with just three eggs a week? In the 1800s, there were not production lines of leghorns that had been bred as production birds. You didn't have that then. So it is a good question. I don't know the answer to that for sure, but one of these days I'll put the research in and see if we can figure out like 150 years ago, what was a really good layer? Here's the other good thing about this bird. They rarely go broody, which if you don't want to hatch eggs is perfect. Little side note, Peggy, my little leg bar, leg bars very rarely go broody. She's trying to go broody right now in February. And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, She's talking to the eggs and pushing them into a nest together. No, you need to stop that immediately. So even a bird that we say rarely goes broody always has a possibility to go broody, but it's very rare at the Mediterranean breed. As soon as you say this never happens, something comes along to make a liar out of you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when I saw her yesterday, like burr, 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 to those eggs, I'm like, uh, sister, no. Well, this does mean that if you want to breed your buttercups, you either need a broody breed or you need to have an incubator. Right. In their native Sicily, they were selected and bred for egg production. We know this. Yeah, the Italians only ate the eggs usually. Right. Eggs were much more frequent source of protein than meat. Generally in Sicily, chicken meat was reserved for special occasions. Right. Along with a lot of the other Mediterranean breeds, they were selected for egg laying. Now, the beautiful buttercup, as we said, is not cold hardy. No. No question about it. Buttercups do need protection from frostbite. This is not a wait and see. They have the kind of comb that can become so badly frostbitten, they end up with a lot of necrotic tissue that can become septic. You need to proactively make sure your buttercups cannot get frostbite. I'd say treat this chicken just like you do every other Mediterranean or on the lines of a bantam. If it's in the 20s or a little lower, make sure they have some heat panel heat just to keep the combs and waddles and the legs and the toes free of frostbite. Just protect them. The other day I saw a blog post up on McMurray's blog page and it was information from Gail Damaro about preventing and treating frostbite. She does start off a little bit talking about moisture, but she doesn't really stay with that as the culprit. She explains that frostbite is frostbite, it's due to cold. And this was interesting to me because we know this, but we haven't seen a number quantified. She says if the temperature for an extended period of time does not get above 25 Fahrenheit, your birds are definitely at risk of frostbite. And that's across the breeds. Yeah, exactly. So just be prepared and prevent problems. Just remember, Vaseline's not going to cut it. They need either to come in or they need supplemental heat. The good news is they're definitely very heat hardy. Yay! So they're much better for the South or in an environment where you're going to be warm most of the year or have less cold winters. They're pretty friendly. They're talkative. 
a lot of people call Mediterranean breeds a little on the flighty side. We say this all the time. You get out what you put in. If you put in a lot of work with birds and you handle them a lot and you teach them that your hand is a thing of love and care, they can be a really friendly bird for you. They can be very friendly, very gentle, very talky, all the things we love. They are flighty in the truest sense of the word. They have a strong startle reflex and they can fly. Hence, they are flighty. Every run, we believe, should have a roof. When you have these little birds who are not heavy, they can fly. So you have to make sure that you have something to stop them from getting up in trees or anything else because they're yeah. light-bodied. They do like to roam and they do love to dig and forage. They're another breed that's not really happy confined in a small space. So if you're building your run for buttercups, make it big. They do make good homestead birds. They can be used as a dual purpose bird. They are fantastic in the yard and garden. Like set them loose in your winter beds. They'll clean it all up and turn it over. They'll turn over your compost pile. The other thing they'll do for you pretty quickly is defoliate an area. So if yeah. you have like a grassy area that you want to use for a garden, put your buttercups on it for a week or two. They'll do the job for you. <laughs> yeah. So they make good layers, good pets. They do make good show birds, although because they're rare now, you're not seeing them in shows the way you used to, but they are good show birds if you can find a supportive community to show in. The only thing you have to watch out for is colder temperatures. They're light-bodied Mediterranean bird. Okay, so let's tell everybody where you can find the Sicilian buttercup. Well, it just so happens that Murray McMurray Hatchery has a beautiful line of buttercups, just gorgeous. Yay! You can also visit the Livestock Conservancy's breeder directory, see if you can find anybody close to you. There is an American Buttercup Club website. It's quite a nice website if you want to go look at some photos. They do have a list of some breeders and they offer, you know, advice, breed standard, all that kind of thing. And Sandhill Preservation also sells them. They are straight run. Keep in mind, a bird that's critically endangered and on that list you're not going to be getting just females. And this would be an excellent conservation effort or project for you to do because it's a small bird. They're not taking up a lot of space. This would be great. So you can get them straight run over at Sand Hill Preservation. There are some other hatcheries that carry them. McMurray is a great source. One of the reasons is because their buttercups are sexed. So you can get yourself a group of, say, I'm just making this up. 20 hens and two roosters, and you can have two different breeding pens if you want to. Right. And McMurray will ship to pretty much anywhere in the country. That's one of the things I love about McMurray is their attention to these breeds who are critically endangered and having these lines available to the normal person so that we can extend them. Well, next year when I beef up the Mediterraneans, there might be some buttercups happening. That'll be good. So if you have the Sicilian buttercup, send us pictures. We want to flood our stories this week with the Sicilian buttercup. You and your chicken, send us those pictures. DM us on Instagram and I'll put them up on our stories. One of our listeners, Chelsea, sent us a photo of a silky that she had blown dry after a bath. It looked like this chicken just went and had a Brazilian blowout at the fanciest salon around. It made me laugh. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Amazon.com or Nestera.us. Use our code CWTCLP10 for 10% off. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosties' store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple, and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosties range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. This week's main topic, we're talking with Sean and Patrick, who are the co-founders, co-owners of Grubbly's. Given all the food controversy lately, we thought it would be really good to hear from a smaller feed company who has put a lot of care into setting up their business and just hear some of the particulars about how it works when you're a feed company, how you formulate, how you source your ingredients, etc. So yeah, we had a great interview. Thanks again to Sean and Patrick. 
It's so much fun talking to them. Here's their interview. Enjoy. Welcome back to the show. How are you guys doing? Doing very well. Thank you so much for having us back. Of course. Chicken feed is in the news in a big way right now. And so what we'd like to talk to you about are just basics of how, as a feed producer, you formulate things, maybe a little bit about sourcing, since we know that the black soldier fly grubs are one of the biggest components of your feed. When you started Grubly Farms, when you started making feed, how did you decide what components you were going to use? Yeah, when we started looking at formulating feed for chicken, so obviously the black soldier fly grub was the large or main component that we knew we wanted to make up the main protein source. But it really then just came down to educating ourselves and speaking with as many people in the industry as possible, trying to figure out what are the essential both macro and micronutrients that chickens need in order to thrive. And ultimately, that is really the large question when you're looking at what is the optimal feed for your pet chicken. When looking at the overarching concept of how chicken feed is formulated, it really does come down to a different question of what is the purpose of the chicken in the sense that a commercial layer versus a commercial broiler will have different nutrient needs based on what the company is actually looking for on the output of the chicken versus a chicken that is a pet or in part of your backyard flock where egg production is obviously important, but focusing on the overall health of the bird is really the number one factor that came down to us when we were looking at formulating our feed. I love that you're taking both aspects of chicken keeping, the meat chicken versus the egg layer, because we know that those chickens have different nutritional requirements and need different things to thrive. And that's really the main word in all of this is to thrive. Talking with our veterinarian before, we know that they need these things to thrive and then they're able to have the reproductive system work and lay the eggs. Exactly. And I think that was really one of the largest reasonings on why we decided not to use corn or soy in our formulation. Really through our own education, we realized it's not a natural diet source for chickens and that it can actually longevity wise actually cause some intestinal issues in the chicken. And the reason why it's actually used in a lot of commercial feed is just because it can pack on weight very quickly. And really, the longevity of a chicken is not the most important factor when looking at it at the commercial livestock scale. But when you are viewing it as a backyard bird where your chicken can live seven to 10 years, you really do want the health to be the number one factor. So aside from basically looking at what ingredients we wanted to limit out of our formula, we also did want to focus on what are additional ingredients that do offer those added health benefits that not only help the health of the chicken, but also will help the chicken produce better quality eggs that in turn help the owner of the chicken, which is you. Yeah. Can you give us some of the key ingredients that you put in the food to also help with that thriving? Yeah, so our flagship ingredient is the black soldier fly grub, and, and that's really the key ingredient into to all of our products. The soldier fly in particular is so important because it is an animal-based protein. Chickens are not vegan by nature. They eat grubs. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to have a chicken that is actually straight vegan. Like if you're preventing them from eating bugs in the ground, that's a pretty airtight coop. So the soldier fly is really key for us providing a natural source of food that chickens can really thrive on. Aside from that, chickens have other dietary needs. They need a certain amount of carbohydrates. They need a certain amount of fat. They need a certain amount of calcium, obviously. So looking at things like wheat or barley for where chickens get energy because laying eggs takes a lot of energy. They need a certain amount of calories per serving of their food. Obviously, eggs are super high in calcium. I believe that the shells are like 95% calcium. So if the chickens aren't getting it directly in their diet, then they can actually pull calcium from their bones, which is just as bad as it actually sounds. Uh, fun for the chicken, that's for sure. Yeah. So when looking at what chickens need, we want to make sure that we include ingredients that support all parts of the chicken's functions. We want to make sure that we have enough calcium, enough protein to help make the eggs, but also support their natural feather growth and replacement to make sure that they have healthy plumage. And then we also really focus on the micronutrients. And so we focus really heavily on the vitamin and minerals that go into our feed as well to ensure that all these chickens get more than enough of things like magnesium or iron or phosphorus and really making sure that chickens get everything they possibly need in our diets. You mentioned fat and we just did an episode with Dr. Rebecca Ganaris, who's a poultry specialist veterinarian, and she talked about fat as one of the building blocks. Does the fat in your feed come from the black soldier fly grubs or do you have to use another source of it? 
A portion of it does come from the soldier fly. And we actually use soldier fly protein. So it does actually have the fat removed from it, similar to any other type of protein meal that separates the, the fat from the protein. But there still is a portion of it that has fat. There's several other ingredients that have fat in it as well. We also have sunflower oil. So there's another fat source there. So it does come from a variety of different sources, but it is all from ingredients that we would personally eat ourselves. That's great. We know this from talking to these guys before that they tried to make the black bean soldier fly grub burger. They're big fans. So basically the science behind the food is just so important and knowing And you've probably had to do lots of testing on your food to make sure that you're still getting a right formula. What percentage of protein is in your food for layers? It's a 16% layer feed. However, we typically overformulate most of our feed. Nothing crazy. So it's not like it's a 50% protein feed or anything like that. But I believe that when we last tested it, which was a month ago, if, if not even more recent, I think it was came in at like 17 or 17 and a half. But we want to make sure that we overformulate for whatever the chickens needs, whatever they can benefit from having a little bit more of. Again, the values are minimum advertised, not like the exact amount. So we again, we just want to make sure that whenever we sell something that we're doing it really, really well. So again, that's why we have our feed typically comes in at around 17 or so percent protein. So it's right in that layer range of 16 to 18 that the average laying hen would need. Perfect. Can you tell us a little bit about your quality control process? Yeah. So we've been very upfront with this in the past that we do work with a third party feed mill that actually develops the feed. And we basically did set up a pretty strict QA process with them because we do have limited ingredients in our feed and we want to minimize any potential contamination. So it really comes down to working with other feeds that are corn and soy free before they even run our feed mill, that they can't run a corn or soy based feed in the machinery before they run our feed mill. And then there's also a washout cycle where they will actually clean the equipment to make sure and reduce any potential contamination. Then there is also just looking at your standard pathogen testing or heavy metal testing, which is both done on the actual finished product of the feed, but also on the raw ingredients. And for us specifically, the soldier flies, just because their nutrient level will vary slightly depending on how the grubs are actually grown and what they're raised on. And as Patrick mentioned, when we're looking at the grub protein or the grub meal after the fat has actually been removed, Depending on the efficiency of that equipment running that day, you're going to have, might have a slightly higher protein level or a slightly lower fat level, depending on how much oil is extracted. So there's always going to be minor variations, but that's across the board for any feed ingredient. Exactly. Uh, but it's really just making sure that those fall in with a standard deviation so that, as Patrick said, we're still hitting the minimum nutrient levels as advertised, which is why sometimes it'll be slightly above what is on the ingredient label. I would imagine anyone who produces feed Your focus is going to be making sure that your feed is delivering the nutrients. That's the most important thing. That's your top priority is making sure that you're putting out a food that is high quality and that's going to support the health of everyone's backyard beloved pets. Mm -hmm. For the feed manufacturers we work with, uh, absolutely. Again, I will say when you look at the commercial feed scale and some of these lower quality feeds, health is not the number one priority that they're really focusing on. It's finding cheap ingredients that will get the chicken to where it is needed. So again, there is kind of that dichotomy between your pet chicken and a commercial chicken as far as the quality of the ingredients and the care really put into the formulation itself as far as what is being optimized, really the health of the chicken versus efficiency of whatever the output of the bird is that you're looking for. So how do you go about sourcing your ingredients, say the carbohydrate components? So the feed mill that we work with sources the ingredients aside from the solar flood protein on our behalf. But they are a small batch, a small run feed mill, especially when you're looking at gigantic commercial mills like the Purinas or Cargills of the world. Like Sean said, when we set them up as a supplier of ours, we have pretty strict guidelines of what we accept versus what we don't accept. And then they are able to more or less take our guidelines and they have a sourcing team and they're able to source particularly the larger use ingredients. We've also at times picked out ingredients ourselves and then just asked them to buy it on our behalf, which has worked out well. So depending on the ingredients, they'll either source it or they will source it based on an ingredient that we found. We hear a lot about supply chain disruption. And given the fact that you are using black soldier fly grubs as your main source of protein and you are having them produce sustainably, how realistic is it to worry about bugs becoming (laughs) scarce? 
Luckily, the insect industry as a whole has seen a large number of investments over the past number of years. I actually believe worldwide, it's over a billion dollars over the past decade has been invested into these insect farms. And I think Mm. close to 500 million over the past couple of years has been invested. So really, the industry together is kind of at the cusp of actually breaking into this larger ability to start catering toward larger commercial farms, where previously it was more of for niche commercial or even backyard uses. So I actually think that really the time of when we were nervous about not having enough bugs is coming to an end as some of these larger facilities do come online. That's something that we're obviously very excited about. So you offer the roomy dog treats, which my dogs go crazy for. (laughs) Is there any possibility that you're going to make a dog crunch? You know, like a feed. Yes. So really the benefit of the grub protein is that it can be used in such a wide variety of animal feeds and that it benefits them for both some of the similar reasons, like the higher calcium, like all animals need calcium for bone development, obviously chickens for eggs. But there are a bunch of other added benefits that can be applied for traditional pets like dogs and cats. Part of the, I guess, process kind of working with the FDA, the USDA and an independent organization called AFCO is they actually have to approve all animal feed ingredients. So one thing that the insect industry kind of together has been pushing for is what research and feed trials and digestibility studies are needed in order to get the black soldier fly approved for all of these pets or animals moving forward. So I do like to say the U.S. is you know one to two years behind a lot of European countries where they have already approved a handful of traditional pets as well as other farm animals for using black soldier fly ingredients. The U.S. actually is evaluating a lot of these. So right now, legally, you can actually sell a black soldier fly dog food. So that could be something on the horizon. I know the United States is currently also reviewing it for cats. So really, there are a handful of benefits that it's offered to. It really comes down to what the customer is looking for. So, you know, we are kind of testing the waters with the Roomies launch, figuring out if the sustainable protein and the health benefits are resonating. And so far, we have seen some pretty positive results. That's the other thing. Companies that have foods for pets do high levels of testing for taste, for the thriving process along through the years. This isn't just a process that you test the food in the beginning and that's it. You run continuously making sure you follow these animals throughout and make sure they're doing well, correct? Yes. Yeah, so some of the early testing is more on the, like the palatability side and the digestibility side, and making sure that the animal is getting all the nutrients and that it's actually enjoying the food or the snack. Once you do have that set up, your formulation probably won't change too frequently unless you're making large alterations to it. But then the remaining testing as you sell the product is really on the quality control side. It's making sure that the producer is holding themselves up to the highest standards that you've set for them and any stop gap set where if there was any contamination issue, you'd be able to either stop that production line or recall certain goods. Well, we love your food and our listeners give us feedback of high praise for your food. We have some listeners that come back to us and say how much they love it and how their chickens love it. Our chickens love it. So it's a great food. Did you all have the 17-year cicada where you are or was that just up here in the north? I don't think that we can. You would know it if it happened. It was bad. It's a 17-year cicada cycle. And when it happens, they are coming up from pretty much everywhere. You know, your trees are getting covered with them. And I'm bringing it up because if you've ever seen chickens hunting cicadas. I had one chicken. She could eat like 20 of them in 20 seconds. And they're about an inch and a half to two inches yeah. long. Yeah, I think Georgia is right on the edge of where the majority of the cicadas emerge. So I we did get some of them, but I don't think anywhere near the swarms. I didn't see any swarms, at least. Yeah, I mean, that's the next one. See how you can work that into cicadas in the food. Yeah, high protein there too. In theory, yes. I don't know if a farmer would want to spend 13 years growing a bug out just for... (laughs) Right. (laughs) Not the most efficient cycle. Yeah. (laughs) So we have a lot of new listeners this year who are planning to get chickens. What's your best advice for people who are starting out and they need to pick the feed they're going to be giving both their chicks and their new layers? Selfishly, I'd like to say just make it easy on everyone and pick grubbly feed. But realistically, we know that sometimes our feed is not available for everybody for financial reasons or not wanting to take deliveries instead wanting to support a local feed and seed, which is phenomenal. I would say pay attention to ingredients, even like the quality of ingredients, like not all wheat is made the same, for example. Like we have wheat proper 
There's things like wheat midlands, which is a much lower tier of wheat. It's kind of like a byproduct of actually making wheat itself. So it's a lesser quality ingredient. Pay attention where the protein source comes from. So like for us, it's largely black soldier fly protein. For several other feeds, you're going to see soy or soybean meal or something like that as like a number one ingredient for particularly those low cost formulations. Pay attention to particularly like what, what are the first four or five ingredients? That's where the bulk of the macronutrients are going to come from. Your protein, your fat, your carbohydrates are going to be coming from the top five ingredients. And so for ours, it's peas, wheat, grubs. I just highly recommend paying attention to what the ingredients are and just that they are they're going to be the higher quality versions. The label can be your best friend. Read the label, understand it. If you're not understanding something, use Google as your friend, look it up and figure out what exactly the quality of ingredients mm -hmm. is in the food. We know you guys pay so much attention to the quality of your food. That's why we love it so much. So just learning how to read the label and looking at it can be really beneficial for people. Yeah. And then reviews online can be really helpful as well. We have a 4.7 out of 5 stars, I believe, on our feed. We're very proud that we're so highly regarded. There are other feed companies out there that have similar reviews. So those are probably still very good companies to purchase from. And then there's other companies that don't get great reviews online or there just are no reviews online. And that's for a reason. Me personally, I typically like to shop with smaller companies just in general. Coffee is a huge thing for me. I buy all my coffee from local roasters. I like to drink beer from small craft beer companies. My clothing comes from typically smaller companies, although they're now getting to be kind of big. Uh, My favorite are farm brews. Do you like farm brews? She's back to beer. <laughs> oh, back to beer. Back she to never beer. left beer. I never farm left brews. beer, okay. man. Up here, we have farm brews. It's so cool. So the farms, they'll make the beer right there on the farm. And then when you go, you drink the beer and there's mm -hmm. bands on the farm and the chickens are running around. That's very it's cool. I did actually go to one just outside of Austin, Texas. But it was very cool because it was all like wild yeast and different types of like fruit sours that all the major ingredients were grown on the farm. Super cool experience. So I've been wondering about fish meal. A lot of companies use fish meal and we actually did some research on it. It's an important source of methionine that chickens need. Just as an aside, that's another reason why you shouldn't be feeding goat food to your chickens because <laughs> goat food is not high in methionine. Anyway... Besides that particular nutrient, what is it that the fish meal does and how do you replace it in Grubley's feed? Yeah. So I guess for those of you who don't know, fish meal is usually small schooling fish called forage fish ground into a protein powder after their oil has been extracted. And it is one of the cheaper animal-based proteins versus corn and soy being a plant-based protein. But you are correct that uh, it has one of the highest inclusion rates of anthionine compared to other ingredients used. But there's actually some really interesting, I guess, studies about methionine. Apologies, methionine, methionine, I'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced. So if someone can correct me, please. No worries. Um, we say it the same way you've been saying. Yeah. No worries. But apparently there was actually some back and forth with the USDA as far as being able to use synthetic methionine in uh, chicken feed because it's hard to get it from a natural process at high enough levels uh, in order to keep up with chicken feed production. So that's actually one of the reasons why fish meal is used aside from it just being an animal protein and on the cheaper side compared to some other meals on the market. But really, that actually is one of the benefits of the soldier fly, that the soldier fly grub actually has one of the highest percentages of methionine compared to any other ingredient used in chicken feed. The black soldier fly is right around 2.1%, which is basically comparable to fish meal. So aside from the chicken getting all of this absolutely needed micro ingredient in their chicken feed, you're also offering just a natural diet in the sense that, you know, I've jokingly said, I don't know if I would ever see a chicken naturally fish. I mean, if you think of like maybe grabbing a minnow out of a stream, but I don't know in a normal chicken's diet if fish is part of what they would be foraging for. So I do think there are some questions again, where is the nutrient level there? Yes. But is it as natural of a diet as possible? And the answer is probably no. And, you know, I think that's another question as far as why we really got into this and really are pushing for the use of the soldier fly and chicken feed. I love it. Yeah. And I mean, there's nothing else to say. It's just purely amazing that you can take out one of these really low quality ingredients with one thing. Right. And give right. them all the nutrients that they need. 
it's unrelated to methionine, but if there's too large an inclusion rate of fish meal in the feed, all of a sudden your eggs can have like a fishy taste to it. And I do like lox and like the poached egg, but I don't know if I want my egg to actually just taste fishy. Uh, can you that would not be good. Making a cake with fishy eggs. No, no I would not like that. Not no. at all. No. I also read recently that if you feed too much garlic and onion, that that flavor can come out in the egg, yes. which... That's true. I, I, talking about like baking a cake or something well, like that, like a, a garlic cookies, garlic cake. You're not supposed to be giving your chickens onions anyway. That's one of the no foods. One of the alliums. Yeah. Okay. Let me just clarify this. Yeah. I have not I have given not my, my chickens, chickens onions. onions. <laughs> but garlic is true. Yes. If you give too much, you can have a garlic cake. Delightful. Chicken, so that might be good, but I don't know. Well, I was going to say a garlic like cake might sound terrible, but, you know, a garlic egg might be interesting if you're just making scrambled eggs. This is true. Yeah. Pre-seasoned scrambled eggs. Pre-season yeah, exactly. Eggs. So what's new on the horizon from Grubblies? What can we keep our eyes out for? I mentioned the vitamin mineral packets that, that we want to come out with to support any variance in the mineral and vitamin needs of chickens as they're going through various stages of their life or times of the year. We're going to do the same thing with a probiotic and prebiotic mix, and then same thing with an omega-3 booster. And so we're going to come out with this set of three different mixes that you can actually just add into your feed or to Grubblies. And we're calling it kind of a, a choose your own adventure, if you will. So for example, my chicken needed thiamine, so I would probably have just started off with vitamins and minerals. If I really wanted omega-3 boosted eggs, I would add omega-3s to their grubblies or their feed. Similarly speaking, if I noticed like dietary or like digestive issues, you know, I might throw in the probiotics or prebiotics. And obviously you can you know, mix any of them together or all of them together and just super boost your chicken all the way through. So that's one of the things that we're really excited about. Aside from that, we are really excited about an all flock feed that we hope to launch in the next couple of months. Oh my God, this one has been Yay. begging you guys to do an all flock. Now my roosters well, can eat grublies too. It's been formulated. So we have the, the formulation ready. It's really just packaging and launch plan to get it to market. Fantastic. We couldn't let you go unless we ask you one more time. Do you have a new favorite chicken breed or is it the same one as last time? I, I probably don't... said Polish last time because I, I really do. I have one other white crested Polish that I really, really like a lot. And I kind of want another one or two Polishes to add to the flocks. If that's what my answer was last time, I'm going to stick with Polish. I butcher the name every time I try and say it, but the completely black chicken still just <laughs> blows my mind. So I will stick with my previous answer. Have you gotten the chicken bug watching Patrick get his chicken? So are you any closer to getting chickens or no? I am definitely considering it. My biggest hurdle is my dog. He likes to terrorize the chickens when he goes to Patrick's house. I will say as time <laughs> has gone on, he has definitely become more normalized to it. So I do think that there's the opportunity at some point in the future. But the initial couple of weeks, uh, he was just looking through the fence, just thinking, oh, I'm just going to get in there and and I was just like, that is just not the attitude that we need to have with him. So no. uh, hopefully at some point in the future, I'll be able to get some. But uh, as of right now, my dog is the limiting factor. Oh, okay. that's OK. I'm sure your dog's like, yeah, I'm the only one. I would also say that my first year of chicken ownership probably is not convincing anybody that having chickens is fun. You got hit hard. You got hit you hard. Did. Some people, it takes them like two or three years before they've encountered all those things. And you got them Most right away. Most people have what I call the honeymoon period yeah. of the first two years of nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you well, it probably better. will be. It probably will be. And the benefit of that is you're probably a lot quicker than most people at spotting problems with your chickens. Yeah. That's certainly been one thing is that being so just surrounded by everything chicken related and then being an important part to not only my family, but Grubbly Farms as a whole, I, I do see them quite a bit. I will say that they have been cooped up quite a bit over the past two months. The weather's just been so horrible here that I haven't wanted to go outside. And if I'm not outside, I'm not going to let them free range. So right. yeah, exactly. Uh, it's smart. Over the past week that has warmed up, it's gotten a little sunny, less rain. We've been able to to prearrange them some more and they, they seem to be considerably happier. Nice. Patrick has my same taste in chickens. I'm getting three Houdans this year, which is basically a cousin of the Polish. Nice. I do like the crested birds. And the whole reason I haven't gotten Polish or Houdans is because of feather blindness. Yeah, I like a bird with a like, big bouffant. Oh, those are so funny looking. 
they they're, are. They're actually super cute. It's just, I've got so many birds and I have one that needs her crest trimmed. Yeah. And I just don't want to do that with like a whole flock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. We want to thank you guys for coming on and chatting with us. There's some important stuff out there about feed right now. We're so happy to have you on and chat the science of grublies because it's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank for, you so much. You know, we're so happy to uh, to have been invited back. Of course. We'll talk to you guys later and we hope to have you on again soon. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Bye. We just want to say thank you one more time to Sean and Patrick for a great interview. We really learned a lot from it. It was so much fun talking to the guys. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. This week, we're going to put a little spin on an egg classic. And we're going to talk about the spaghetti frittata. You heard that right. We're putting two classics together and it makes something new and exciting. It's fun. It is so good. Now, I got to tell you, I've actually been making this since I was a kid, but didn't know it had a name. I used to just call it a spaghetti omelet. But really, it's a spaghetti (laughs) frittata. This is total comfort food. It's so delicious. You can do it with any pasta. You don't have to use spaghetti. Spaghetti is obviously the classic, but anything you happen to have. It takes about four cups of pasta. So a lot of times you're going to end up cooking it because you may not have four cups of pasta left over. Right. So just cook it because you're going to use it all in this frittata. So let me go through the ingredients for everybody that we have for our spaghetti frittata. And this is one too that you can make your own. You can kind of specialize to your own taste buds, but this is the way that we do it. We do one onion chopped, some garlic, about a clove or more. This is one where you can do more or less minced. Four large eggs. So it's in the middle. It's not a big amount of eggs. And right now everybody's starting to get some. A half a cup of milk or plant-based milk. A half to three quarters of a cup of mozzarella cheese or dairy-free cheese. Now in the DiCarlo house, that's just eyeballed every time. It's as much cheese as you can fit into it. No doubt. I should say a half a cup to a DiCarlo cup. The Carlo <laughs> cup is like a five cupper. Okay, two tablespoons of chopped fresh parsley, two tablespoons of fresh basil. These are, again, you can play with the amounts to your liking and your taste. And a tablespoon of chopped fresh oregano, salt and pepper to taste, and then a half a cup of pasta sauce. So that's all you need. And then you can make this can be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It really is delicious. So you're going to finish this in the oven. So you want to preheat your oven to about 400 or 425, depends on how hot your oven runs. And you want a large oven-proof nonstick skillet in the DiCarlo household. This is going to be iron. Every time it's a cast iron, yep. In the Cosmala household, it's ceramic. They do the same thing. So in your skillet, you're just going to heat a generous splash of olive oil or butter, if that's what you're into. You're going to heat it over medium heat. I'm going to put your onions in. Cook them for around seven or eight minutes until they're starting to soften. Do you ever see that they'll say onions, they take like three to four minutes to soften? No. It never happens in three to four minutes. Whenever I'm trying to soften onions, it takes at least seven to eight minutes. If you do it too high, then you burn them. Then they get bitter and it's gross. No, it's seven to eight minutes. We're keeping it real. Then you add your garlic and you're going to cook for another three or four minutes to soften your garlic. At that point, they should be starting to brown and caramelize a little bit. You don't want it to go too far, just lightly browned. You're going to put them in a large mixing bowl and let them cool a little bit. You can wipe out the pan if you want. Or if you're like me, you're going to leave the onion bits in there because it's good. I leave the onion in there every time. Mm -hmm. In that large bowl, the reason you're going to let your onions cool a little bit is because you're going to put your eggs and milk in that bowl and you're going to scramble it all together. Just whisk it. Then you're going to stir in your cheese and your seasonings. And then the pasta. Whichever pasta you want to use. I just like the spaghetti in there, but it really can't be any kind of pasta you want. Then you're going to take that skillet that you did not wipe out and probably add a little more spray or butter to it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Pour the egg mixture in. I just kind of tilt the pan a little bit so it evens out. You want the pasta distributed throughout the frittata. You don't want it all mounded in one place. And you want to cook it until it makes somewhat of a solid mold. It doesn't have to be super solid. That is going to end in your baking. But if you really cook it longer on the stove, then it's shorter in the oven. If it's shorter on the stove, it's longer in the oven. So just until it kind of makes a mold. Yeah, until it's forming a frittata. Then you're going to carefully pour that sauce on top. I said half a cup, but if you want more, put more on there. It's to taste, really. And sprinkle your remaining mozzarella or Parmesan or whatever you want to put on there. I use dairy-free mozzarella. You're going to transfer that baby to the oven. 
Now, the baking, like Chrissy just said, it depends on how long you cooked it on the stovetop. If you mostly cooked it on the stovetop, you don't want it in there for more than five minutes or so, probably. We do it a little differently. Holly Ann cooks it longer on the stovetop. I cook it shorter on the stovetop. Right. You just need to keep an eye on it. Know what you did in one place so that you can adjust for the other. Yeah. So you just cook it until the eggs are starting to come together on the bottom, and then you bake it for like 15 or 20. I feel like for me, that melts the cheese a little bit better on top. It gives it a little bit longer time for the cheese to get brown on top. I think the difference there is that the dairy-free cheese doesn't really melt the same way. Exactly. I usually cook it until the bottom is browned a bit and then in the oven for maybe 10 minutes tops. Yeah. And I said exactly, like exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Ha ha ha. You know, we're not big on the egg puns around here. We're not, but that one kind of just came out. It just came out. There it was. So give this a try. I mean, it's an amazing dinner to make for your sweetheart, even though Valentine's Day is over. Well, I kind of feel like the whole month of February is about Valentine's Day. Why not? I like that. Well, like we said, this is really, really, really delicious comfort food. Makes your house smell amazing. It's good for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Or if you're going to just have your bestie over, talk chickens. Or we like to do it when we have Dr. Rebecca and we have Kelly from Poultry DBM over and we have lunch together. This is one of those things that we love to serve. All eggs, all the time. We do eat a lot of eggs. (laughs) We do. If you make it, let us know what you think. Send us pictures. We'll give you a story. Okay, so let's move on to re- Retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. So this week's retail therapy, we're just going to talk over some of the Grubbly's products. We had that great conversation with Sean and Patrick, the co-owners of Grubbly's. And we want to just reiterate when you go over to Grubbly's, what you're able to get. And there's some amazing stuff over there. We have a lot of new listeners and we have a lot of listeners who are getting their chickens for the first time. So they may not have explored feed options before. Go over to the website and take a look at some of the feed. If you're a first time buyer, use our code because it's 30% off. It's CWTCL30, our initials with 30 at the end, all caps. If you're a first time buyer, you get that 30% off and you can try it. It's a really great discount and it's worth it. So let's go through some of the things you can get over at Grubbly's. First off, and probably what we both use the most of, is Little Pex, the Grubbly's chick food. We love it. We really do. I mean, our chicks thrive on it. I love the fact that it's an insect-based protein, which is so natural for little ones. Our chicks, last season, we have fed it. Our chicks that we're getting again in April, they will be fed Grubbly Little Pex exclusively. This food has been amazing for our chicks. And the fact that they're growing so many feathers, the insect-based protein is amazing for them. You can get 30-pound bags over at the website. And if you have three to 10 chicks, that bag's going to last you a while, the 30 pounds. Oh, it does. I've had all my Nankin babies on it, and it does last a good while. And they look amazing. I can't tell you how good the feathers look on the Nankins. Then you have two types of layer food to choose from. Right. Fresh Pex crumbles or Fresh Pex pellets. Great stuff. You just heard about it, all the science behind it. They took out all the fish-based anything in there. Your chickens don't need it because just like we talked about, the soldier fly grubs take away the need to put the fish in there. So it's less ingredients, more high quality ingredients in this food. And it's amazing. Sean and Patrick let slip that there's going to be an off lot coming out. I really look forward to that. My roosters need some off lock. I I think you jumped out of your seat when they told us that. I was so happy. I've been waiting for it. I think they told (laughs) us like over a year ago that they were thinking about having it in the works. So I want to see all my boys on Grubblies. The other thing you can get are black soldier fly larva treats. And there are two options there as well. And this is how the whole company started, are these treats. Right. So you can get hometown harvest. And those are North American grown black soldier fly larva. No fumigating, nothing unpleasant. They're just eating post-consumer waste. So they're a fantastic treat. And those are the ones we feed. Yes. Yeah, those are the ones we feed. There's also a second option, which are like a worldwide, they're a soldier fly that can come from other parts of the world with a lower price tag. So you get your choice there. And the final offering is Vroomy's insect-based dog treats. My dogs love them. And the other thing to check out on the website is They have different things to save you money. So they also have a subscribe and save. So you're going to save 10% if you subscribe. 
They also have coupons that they will email you as you buy different products, $5 rebates or discount codes so that you can get a percentile off. You get um, points on your purchase too. Yes, it's a rewards program on the website. Mm -hmm. So kind of the more you buy, the more discounts you can get. And you can feel good that these guys put so much thought into their product and how to make it better, how to continue to make it the best for your chickens. It's a feed that you can feel really, really good about, snacks that you can feel really good about. So yeah, they're great. Okay, so what should we tell everybody we're talking about next week? Next week, we are closing out February with one of the most beautiful breeds out there, the Pita Pinta Austriana. Our main topic, should you start a chicken flock this year? This is a round table with Fiona, so it should be good stuff. Can't wait. Our recipe, really delicious Italian sugar cookies, very good for spring. One of my favorites, yeah. And our retail therapy, we are reviewing Roosty's new chick feeder and waterer sets. And let me tell you, they're even more amazing than the last ones. You won't want to miss this. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.